Welcome, everybody. Today, I am joined by Father Keith Kinney. He is a former Navy man. He is a priest who celebrates both rites, and he is somebody who I look up to as a spiritual father. I'm oftentimes at his Mass on Sundays. So, Father, thank you so much for coming on. I've been really looking forward to this conversation. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. Well, let's go ahead and just jump right in. The majority of my audience is young men, and the number one thing that I think that young men struggle with right? As a, as a diagnosis, not so much as a symptom, but the, the root of the problem is that young men everywhere lack purpose. Like, I feel like in today's world, they've been given pleasure. They've been given Uber Eats, right? <laughs> Netflix. You have all these things presented to you in abundance, and they've substituted those things, pleasure, for purpose without even knowing it, and that leads to a whole host of problems. So how would you come up to somebody who, or how would you approach somebody, respond to somebody who says that they struggle with meaninglessness or purposelessness? They don't feel like they have that in their life. So I'm going to take uh, two tacks towards it. One's, one's going to be more um, natural and philosophical. The second will be theological. So the natural and philosophical is um, when you're struggling with a lack of purpose, you're drifting. Um, that indicates a lack of virtue and, and usually principally uh, a lack of temperance. Mm. It means that you're, you're, you're satiating all of your appetites. And because temperance is a cardinal virtue, it's fundamental yeah. for a host of the moral virtues. Particularly, I have in mind chastity. Mm. Right? Uh, so, temperance regulates uh, the sensible appetite of the flesh, especially for food and drink. Mm -hmm. um, chastity regulates the sexual appetite. Right? Um, in... English, we say lust, mm -hmm. and Latin, we say luxuria, mm. luxury, right? So um, the cardinal virtues are justice, uh, prudence, fortitude, and temperance. Right. And they're called cardinals from the Latin cardinal cardinals, meaning hinge. Mm -hmm. The moral virtues swing on the cardinal virtues like a door. Yeah. So if I'm weak in temperance, there's almost no chance mm. that I'm, chastity is going to have anything to hold on to, right? And in our society, we're, we're like passively satiating ourselves with entertainment. Yeah. Right? So um, just getting up and going for a, a run or yeah. starting to work out, you'll, you'll find that you lose some of that boredom. Yeah. You, you, have a, you have a discipline in your life. There's a moderation to at least the tempo of your life. Mm -hmm. You have to do strange things like um, work out after work or get up <laughs> early in the morning, right? It, so you rearrange yeah. things, and then suddenly that that empty time that you're being passive gets filled. Yeah, I think St. Paul talks about how I pummel my flesh, right? He talks mm -hmm. about the spirit and the flesh waging war over and over again. And I think people oftentimes get kind of affirmed in their purposelessness and that meaninglessness. Mm -hmm. And what you're saying is basically stop <laughs> being lazy and get up and do something. Is that's that a, kind of, or how would you phrase yeah, that? Yeah, that's a that's big brass. piece. That's a big piece of it. Yeah. If we're not doing nothing, if we're being passive in our lives, um, how do you get a goal? All right. Um, when I was in the Navy, I, I worked out twice a day no. for 45 minutes. It, I read in some magazine somewhere that uh, the, <laughs> the hormones and energies that you needed were exhausted in like 45 minutes. So I was doing all that stuff. Um, but I had goals set in mind, things that I wanted to achieve, like how much I want to uh, bench press for my three rep max and, and those kinds of things. If I went back to the gym today <laughs> and like threw that weight on and got underneath it, I would be yeah. crying out for someone to pick that weight We've off my all chest. Been there. Yeah. Right? <laughs> So I don't want to, in an attempt to overcome that, that missing part of my life, I don't want to start with a goal of, you know, bench pressing 350 pounds. Mm -hmm. I want to start actually with something that's achievable, Yeah. <laughs> right? It's, it's even moderate in the goal making. What I'm looking for here is sustained, persistent progress. Mm. That's it. So as a Catholic priest, I'm curious, <clears throat> how do you feel about the gym culture, all of that stuff, bodybuilding, all of that. Does that tie into the life of virtue well, in your opinion, or is that something that too easily leads to vanity? It too easily leads to vanity. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there's health. Like, 
uh, I'm not a not a great example of it. Um, I want to be healthy enough that I'm not I'm not throwing away the gift. Mm-hmm. Um, however, I don't want to try at the age of fifty to try and look like I'm twenty five. <laughs> There's, uh-huh. there's no virtue in that, right? This prolonged love of youth, there's something beautiful in, in, in age, right? Mm-hmm. And, and aging gracefully. And the gym culture isn't necessarily about being healthy, mm-hmm. right? Um, it often leads to immodesty, right? Because if you're doing that, you want to show what your gains are. Um, and and I think it's deeply connected to like the the cosmetic culture, mm-hmm. right? So um, balding men who who get wigs, um, who get hair plugs, right? Um, my joke in my family is all this um, Botox and uh, plump lip stuff. Like no one's actually fooled by that. <laughs> Everyone immediately identifies that something's been yes. done. And it doesn't actually, it doesn't actually imitate youthfulness. Mm. It, um, it's the same thing that we see when a man starts doing a comb over. Mm. Like you're not fooling anyone. Full disclosure: Did you ever have a comb over? Never. <laughs> I got curly hair, so that wasn't going to work for me. I still got hair around here. Oh. Uh, if I were to let it grow out, it so curl- it's just a tonsure. It curls up, and and I got a little patch right here, so I end up with a ball on the top of my head. <laughs> <laughs> if I have vanity, I have enough not to want to walk around with a curly ball of hair on top of my head. Oh, man. So I went the shaving route. So that was the first answer. It has to do with temperance regarding yeah, the bodybuilding. Temperance. And then the second one you said is theological. It's theological. Um, the theological I would take from um, Father Frederick Faber. Okay. Uh, there's a book out called Spiritual Conferences. And in the the last conference in that book is All Men have a vocation, hmm. right? And so he starts with um, the fundamental truth. I'm gonna butcher him, he's much more poetic than I am. But he says, um, there are some thoughts that uh, are so so deep hmm. that they remain always fresh. And they're this way because uh, they're also among the commonest of thoughts. Mm. They don't exhaust themselves because we never quite know them thoroughly, mm. but they occur They occur to all. Right? Right. You don't need any special capacity to arrive at these okay. considerations. And he said among the most commonest is the thought that occurs in, in all religions. He might be pushing it there. Um, that God loves me. Hmm. That God loves me with a, a, a special and particular love. Mm-hmm. If, if we imagine God's love for mankind as being like a, uh, he gives humanity a cosmic hug, mm-hmm. like he loves us in, in general, um, then you lose, you lose the flavor of it. It's God loves uh, each individual person mm-hmm. in a special and particular way. And he goes on to elucidate kind of um, why this is foundational. Uh, he says, um, of innumerable creatures that um, God foresaw, he left them in their nothingness, mm. but he brought me into existence. Mm. There was the... Wow. And the, and the me as I am, he knew, right? Certainly not perfect. He does call me to be more matched to the image he has of me. Um, but he chose me. They might have uh, worshipped him better. They might have been holier than me. They might have been more interested in me. Mm. And nevertheless, he chose me. And essentially he deduces from this fact that there is some work in this world for which he wants me mm. and no one else will do. So then he says, um, uh, unless we profess this in our hearts, then God really isn't God. 
Mm. And I don't know how men live mm. if they don't have this, this understanding, right? So then based upon that, um, he says, um, the, the view that he takes of humanity as he considers it is that uh, a, the greater number of people um, kind of hold their heads above water, uh, mostly keep themselves out of mortal sin, um, receive the sacraments, do the exercises of, mm -hmm. of piety, and that this in itself constitutes a spiritual life. Because it can't be natural, or it wouldn't end in salvation. Right. So it has to be a supernatural spiritual life. But then he says, typically we reserve the word vocation for uh, a very particular kind of state. Now he leaves out marriage, but that's just a, right. a fact of his time. Um, he says, um, when we speak of vocation, we mean either uh, vocation to the ecclesiastical state, to um, the religious life, to a life of the evangelical councils, or to some life of like philanthropy. And he says this, that last category is the most rare. Mm. Um, and he says that that general view of a vocation expresses a truth, but it expresses it uh, badly. Mm. It expresses it so badly that we might come away with a false idea. He says the truth of the matter is that every man has a special vocation. Mm that there is no vocation that comes in like generalities. Like I, I wasn't called by God to the priesthood, whatever that means, right? <laughs> yeah. He specified it, diocesan priesthood in the Diocese of Phoenix. He's since specified it in ways I wouldn't have understood. Um, associated Our Lady Perpetual Help pastor at St. Margaret Mary's, pastor at St. Anne's, all those are, are specifications of my vocation. Mm -hmm. He says, there's, there's never been another vocation quite like mine from the beginning of time, and there will never be again after me. Mm. For convenience sake, we might group vocations into similarities, right? Um, but he says, um, Coming to this determination, one of God's special love for you as an individual and the fact that you have a, a special vocation from God, mm. a, a purpose, yeah. not of your own devising, right? Is He says this is the, the ground of our love, but also the ground of our deep fear, mm. right? And <clears throat> he goes on to say, um, uh, all the spiritual life revolves around this um, finding out God's will for me mm. that um, and he may not be clear with me about it in fact for some people we may never actually find certainty of yeah. it right if, however, we were to persist in abandoning ourselves to God's will each and every day of our life, making those acts yeah. and doing what is set in front of us today, we get to the end of life and find out we've been doing God's will all along, right? <laughs> um, so to that extent, you actually can't, you can't accidentally miss your vocation. Mm. It's not like there was some turning point in your life and if you didn't respond to God, well, then you're out and there's no, there's no hope for you, right? So he says holiness consists in uh, two very simple things. Uh, the endeavor to know God's will for you mm. and the endeavor to do it when you find it out. Mm. There was this thought that occurred to me a couple of years ago. I think it was by the grace of God, but I was just meditating upon God and upon myself and really praying for the virtue of humility. And it just struck me that there's, there's nothing that God can do through me that he couldn't do better and more easily by himself or through anyone else, mm -hmm. right? Like God's omnipotent. 
So he could choose yeah. anyone else and do a better job at my job with somebody else than with me. And I think once I realized yeah. that, it really, yeah, it's hard to not be humble if you actually believe that statement. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, priests have occasion to consider that. Yeah. Like, it's surprising me that anyone goes to a parish more than once. <laughs> what do you mean? Because, um, you know, the music might be bad. The homily might be terrible. Um, the priest might be goofy. Uh, <laughs> there's just a thousand ways that we all get in each other's ways, from from clerics to laity, laity to clerics. I mean, especially in an ordinary form when I'm saying mass facing to people, like you, you all are not a particularly edifying lot. Right? <laughs> I've, I've learned to blur you out. <laughs> um, people getting up and going to the bathroom and all the things that happen, the, the thousands of distractions. Um, I don't know how edifying we priests are, <laughs> really. Um, and yet somehow God decides in the midst of that kind of like messiness mm. to make himself present. Yeah. If we could actually see it with the eyes of faith, like there's never been anything uh, as beautiful mm. as that. It's, it's a foretaste of heaven. Yeah. You know? And somehow he chooses to need the ministry of priests, not because he needs, hmm. right? Uh, he chooses uh, the cooperation of a husband and wife to bring uh, a new soul into being. Pardon me. Um, that has an eternal destiny. Like he could have done, he could have set that up in any way that he wanted. Yeah. Um, he. He chooses men to cooperate in his work, and not because he's powerless, but but because he's powerful, mm. right? And if you start reflecting on that, it it shows up in so many ways in your life. Yeah, you know? yeah. It reminds me of Alphonsus the Gory says that God, by His promises, has made Himself our debtor. That's right. And that's one of my favorite things to meditate upon because Jesus has said, ask and you shall receive. Right. And to the degree that you believe, right, Jesus, whenever he heals, I believe it's two blind men, he says, according to your faith, be it done unto you. Like God's ability to act through you and in your life in the way that you're describing is limited by your belief and if you asked or not. And I, I just mm -hmm. love that line. God, by his promises, has made himself our debtor. That's right. right? So go back to our, our original question. Um, does God do anything without purpose? I would say no. Is he, is, he, is he flinging you out into the cosmos at kind of random, hoping that he hits his target, <laughs> right? So the, the question isn't whether I have a purpose mm. or whether there's, there's meaning to my existence. I may, I may have the existential angst where I can't recognize it and I don't know what it is, but it is there nonetheless, yeah. right? Even if I don't know. Um, so I think this is one of the gifts that, that faith gives to us, mm. right? Uh, St. Paul says, um, I live by faith in the Son of God because he loved me mm. and gave himself up for me. Not us, mm. right? Me. And every man has to believe that about himself. And until you do, I, I would say your, your true purpose will, will never be, be yeah. manifest to you. Yeah, I work with uh, several guys and they have this struggle inside of them. It's a deep-seated struggle. It's really difficult because from their perspective, they see things going well for their friends who aren't behaving as well as them maybe, mm -hmm. aren't living a life of grace, mm -hmm. and yet they're able to get the girl that they want, start their vocation, do all these other things, right? Maybe they're not even concerned about their vocation. But then they look at themselves and they say, okay, well, I'm praying the rosary, I'm going to mass daily, I'm mm -hmm. doing all this spiritual stuff, yeah. and God keeps saying, not yet, not yet, mm -hmm. not yet. And it's been a decade now maybe, and not yet. Mm -hmm. What would you say to somebody who's in that state because i work with a couple guys like that and it's yeah. it's intense it's tough yeah I, f I felt that yeah i'm a late vocation i went to seminary at 32. yeah uh, i remember going through the process when when my good friends were pairing off and getting married and starting 
starting families. And I remember being somewhat jealous, thinking to myself, like, why is this happening for them and oh. not for me? Like, I'm not saying I'm better than my friends. I'm better than some of them, for sure, right? <laughs> yeah. um, but, but why them, not me? Right. Um, I have a slightly different perspective now as a, as a priest confessor. Mm. The people who you think their lives are going better than yours, they're not. <laughs> that human beings are all in pretty much similar estates. Yeah. Um, we're not very original in our sins. And sin does not make you happy. Mm. It, it makes you stupid. Mm. Right? So what it looks like to our eyes that the wicked prosper. Yeah. And, and even if we were to grant that in some ways they are prospering, wealth, fame, success, prestige, power, whatever that is, all of those things will be um, burning coals for their heads in the light of, of eternal glory, mm. right? So you can't measure the weight of someone else's bushel. Mm. You just simply cannot. You, you don't know what they're dealing with. You don't know where they stand. Um, but all of us know on the basis of revelation that we are in sinners in need of a savior. Yeah. That's the great, the great leveling, right? Um, the most dangerous thing you can ever think to yourself is I've got it all together. Mm. I've, I've arrived, right? Because the minute you think that you're going to attempt to do it underneath your own power. Yeah. That, uh, that makes me think, one of the, I think, strongest objections to theism in general, which is kind of answered by what you just said, but it's the idea of suffering of the innocent, mm -hmm. right? The idea that children sometimes <clears throat> get these horrible diseases. Mm -hmm. So would you say that generally it's not a matter of, it's, everybody gets a cross and everybody gets the strength to carry their cross and it's imprudent to judge the weight of somebody else's? That's right. Is that how you would say that? Yeah, uh, I mean, there's another way, there's a number of ways to think through that. Uh, first, I would say to someone with that kind of objection, has there ever been a life without suffering? Mm. Mine hasn't been free of suffering. It's not free of suffering now. Yeah. Right? Um, I don't even think that um, like the mega wealthy, mega famous, when you when I actually find out later on down the line as, as they fall from grace, and it's usually a pretty long fall, Yeah, that that their lives weren't as peachy keen as you thought they were, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so there's that. What's God's answer to that? Uh, God's answer to that is not be a good little boy or a good little girl and I will sprinkle you with magic Christian pixie dust mm -hmm. and make your problems go away. God's answer to that is I will, I will plant the tree of my suffering Mm. in the midst of you and I will turn it into the tree of life mm. right so I don't know that that gives us consolation so much uh, without faith but at least at a basis God says you're not alone <laughs> yeah right yeah. I'm here with you um, mm. the other way to think through this is uh, Take the question of like gifts. Um, like not everyone can be an Einstein. Right. Right. Um, there might appear to be some injustice in that. Um, what sort of man might I have become if I was that clever? Mm. I might not have ever found my purpose. Mm. Right. Uh, we don't know the way that that goes. Yeah. Uh, give me riches, I might squander it. Um, give me good looks. Well, there's a plenty of paths that can go down, right? <laughs> um, so you, you never know the weight that comes with the, the gifts or the blessings that you're longing for. Yeah. Um, God gives to each for his own purpose. And there's a there's an acceptance both of the gifts mm. and of the sufferings, with the knowledge that um, 
we're sojourners. Yeah. Right? We're strangers in, in, to that sense in the world. And I was not made for this. Mm. The day will come. I, ontologically, I'll always be a priest. But the, the day will come with joy. I will never again say a mass. Mm. <laughs> I will behold God face to face. So not even what I do that um, undoubtedly gives purpose to my life now. Not even that is its, its ultimate purpose. Wow. Uh, the ultimate purpose of my life, if I persist in faith and allow God to lead me, is I, I get to see God face to face. That's the longing of every human heart. You have a God-shaped hole in your heart. I don't care what else you stuff in it. It'll never be enough because you were made for more. Mm. Right? Mm. It's beautiful. It's also, I suppose, why marriage doesn't persist in heaven to a certain extent. Yeah, to a certain extent. I think the quasi-bond, I mean, it doesn't bring about an ontological change. Mm. But there's no doubt that it um, lived in grace and love. It definitely will will make a connection that perdures, right? Yeah. The sacramental bond does not. Um, but there's no doubt that the shared life, there's a shaping factor that's there. It's not like I will get to heaven and not recognize my mom, <laughs> right? Like we're not cut off from each other right. in that way as if none of that mattered. Um, but I will love her uh, more intimately, more intensely, more deeply because by beholding the face of God, I will I will see how God loves her. And that's, mm. it's going to take my breath away. I'm still going to recognize her as my mom. Right? <laughs> that's beautiful. Let's see. So a couple other things here. Uh, you mentioned essentially temperance as being the start mm -hmm. to finding purpose, right? Kind of the foundation. You mentioned the cardinal, right? It has to hang. The door has to hang on that. Uh, whenever it comes to beating lust, I think that one of the things that you look online and you find all kinds of videos about that self-help mm. stuff, they all say cold showers, fast, mm -hmm. um, work out, these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But I think that what's often neglected is the spiritual side of things. And that whenever people have a habit of falling into sins of lust, there are certain spiritual factors that are at play there. Could you give some practical advice for somebody who's maybe trying to get get lust just t entirely out of their life mm -hmm. and they feel like it's not just a natural issue, but there's something beyond that? What, what should they do? Yeah. Okay, F fasting is, in the tradition, constantly going to be recommended, right? Um, but not just as, like, to overcome lust. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is good for that. It's, it's to build temperance, discipline, right? Um, you ought to do those things even if you don't struggle with lust. Mm -hmm. um, St. Alphonse de Guerra says, um, if, you, if you have a temptation that you're struggling with, and you ask him, what shall I do? He says, I will tell you to pray. And... If you ask me a thousand times, a thousand times I will answer prayer, right? Uh, and then he has a real insightful thing that he says I've, that I've never forgotten. A man will give up one of two things. He will give up his prayer mm. or he will give up his sin. And whenever you find yourself falling back in the habits of sin, stop and check and see if you said your rosary. <laughs> yeah. If you don't pray, you're, you're, just, you're just not going to make it, right? Um, to that extent, um, we do sometimes have to take extreme measures. Uh, and this is what normally keeps us back from making the leap. Mm. Um, we admit to ourselves that we have a habit of vice and one that particularly overtakes us by the intensity of its passion and the, uh, the depth of our weakness. Yeah. Um, but we say to ourselves, well, I really mean it this time. So I don't need to get rid of my, my phone. Mm. I don't need to turn off Wi-Fi in my house. Mm -hmm. 
you're essentially walking around like a heroin addict with heroin in your pocket and you're saying, I don't want to use it, I don't want to use it, I don't want to use it. But you've proven to yourself countless times that's what you're going to turn to. Mm. Right? Um, there's a priest, I forget his name, he's got some some YouTube stuff on it. Um, he basically says... Um, you're not free of it until you've been free of pornography for a year mm. without a single fall. He also says, and I don't know if this is true, but he thinks so. He doesn't think you're going to do it without like a, a sexual addicts anonymous type group. Mm. Right. Uh, those who you manifest yourself to uh, someone to hold you accountable. Um, if this is the thing that's kind of constantly rearing its head, uh, you move heaven and earth mm. to remove this thing from your life. Uh, some men can walk into a bar and not have a drop. Some men can walk into a bar and have one and never be tempted to, to have another. And there's some men who cannot go into a bar. Mm. Right? And until we're honest with ourselves about that, uh, even if we're we're making some progress, chances are on a bad day with some stress, if we're angry, uh, if we've given up our prayer, the enemy knows where that, that soft spot is. Now, there can also be attachments of things. Mm -hmm. And... It's worthwhile. It's going to depend on your priest, of course. Uh, any priest worth his salt will pray over you and lay hands on you. And there is power in that. I'm mm. not talking about exorcisms. Um, but there there are other things than being possessed. Mm -hmm. right? um, very often in our own woundedness, um, we can, sometimes it's helpful to have a therapist of sorts, but careful with therapists, um, to identify the start. Mm -hmm. What's it rooted in? What kept it going? There's usually more going on there than mere sexuality. Mm. There's, there's usually um, something that we're medicating ourselves over. Mm. And this is why the enemy's shame is so effective. Because he's touching those those tender wounds. And we do have a tendency to hide them from our, from ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's how I would direct people to go. Yeah. That's good. That's very powerful. Yeah. I think a lot of times people, um, just need confession. <laughs> I think that, you know, I've heard multiple exorcists say that online, that a confession is more powerful than a solemn exorcism. Yeah, the difficulty you find with confession is something in your life has to change. Yeah. And what you'll find is as you begin to desire to be holy and to do holy things, you might get a space of freedom. And then suddenly the temptation comes with frequency or intensity. Mm. Um, San Apostle Gloria describes this too. He says... Um, He's held you like a bird, tethered, and for his own delight, ceases holding the tether for a while, mm. and you get the sensation that you're flying, and to discourage you from all the things that you were doing that actually brought about that progress, he yanks on the tether. Wow. Right? I've not heard that. When... When the enemy is, is throwing everything at you and your life feels like it's coming unraveled and it's not clearly because uh, you've become negligent in the spiritual life or you've, you've done something wrong of sorts, uh, it's almost always an indication that he sees you escaping. Mm. Right? So before I went to seminary, uh, I was doing like, uh, holy hours and stuff and uh, I had the code to go into the chapel <laughs> and uh, 
And if I couldn't sleep, I'd get up and, and go visit the Lord. Loved it. Loved every bit of it. Um, got to seminary and they made me do a holy hour at a particular time. And I, I began wrestling with, like, I don't like this. I don't, I, I don't like being made to do this. There's, there was enough rebellion in me that I was mm -hmm. like, you tell me when I have to go to bed. You tell me when I have to get up, when I'm supposed to pray. Um, I, I think every seminarian experiences, uh, at some point, there's this deep discouragement that settles on you. Um, because the enemy sees what you're about to do. I would imagine in preparation for marriage this happens. Because yeah. the last thing the enemy wants to see is for you to have a holy, mm -hmm. joyful marriage. He does not want those things for you. So when it ratchets up, if we can understand it under this rubric mm -hmm. where, okay, like this intensity, this weight that I feel I'm going to collapse underneath, this is actually a good. Mm. I I might be rounding the bend on this thing if I can if I can hold out for one more minute, for three more minutes, for another day, for another month. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's how you get yourself free. The other thing that I would suggest in that. Um, you familiar with um, San Ignatius Loyola's spiritual exercises? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So he's got this little passage that we tend to pass over. He's got these lines by which you you keep track of your fault, mm. and you make little points on it to see how often you fall, and you compare one week to the second week to see if there's progress, so you can measure what you're doing. Mm. Um, if my problem is lust, I'm I'm a fool. Uh, to piously ask God for humility. Mm. Why is that? Because that's not my problem. Mm. <laughs> my problem is <laughs> lust, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, if I'm uh, if I'm out of shape, which I am, um, because I don't exercise, well, the remedy to that is to exercise at least some, right? Mm -hmm. um, if if I'm out of shape because I overeat, sure, exercise is going to help. You know, it's going to help more. Like, Not ever put eaten. down the bonbons, <laughs> right? There's, there's a practicality yeah. uh, to this. If if you've identified your principal vice, sure, you can ask God for all the other virtues, and we ought to. But I'm going to beg him mm. for the grace to overcome this principal vice in my life. And I'm going to ask for it every morning. I'm going to take um, attendance of my heart. Uh, at the half day to see if I've fallen. If I have fallen, I will repent and ask God for the grace not to fall for the rest of the day. If I haven't fallen, I'll give thanks to God for preserving me from myself. I'll get to the evening and I'm going to take attendance again from the, the, the midday point to the evening. How did I do? And I'll do the same thing. And before I go to bed, I'll ask God for the grace to do better tomorrow than I did today. Hmm. And I'll hold myself accountable. Not in a way of beating myself up, but being honest with myself, right? Um, if you're going from mortal sin to mortal sin in pornography and like daily use, mm -hmm. and you have a day without pornography, that that's a day of victory, mm -hmm. right? But you might have let your eyes linger in a lustful way. You might have uh, allowed your lustful thoughts to entertain you. Those are still sins. They still need to be repented of. The fact that you didn't use pornography isn't in and of itself. I'm, I'm free. Right. Right. The the roots are there. Uh, and so this is a common thing. If someone moves from, like, um, the use of explicit pornography. Mm -hmm. They might take refuge for a time in just immodest pictures mm. and and satiate themselves by saying, "Why well, it's not it's not pornography." Right. It's like, well, it's pornography adjacent. Right? <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you have to be you have to be honest with yourself, and um, and you have to be consistent. It's the the consistency, the persistence of it. Yeah. Um, 
God, as St. Augustine says, commands chastity, right? Mm. So he will grant what he commands. <laughs> yeah. He will not leave you bereft of it, but you're going to have to cooperate with him. Now. And if anybody knows about that struggle, it's Augustine. <laughs> it's Augustine. God, God, give me consonants, but not yet. Not yet. Yeah. Not yet. Honest prayer. It is an honest yeah. prayer. Not a very good one, maybe, but a very it's honest one. <laughs> Okay. And then uh, last thing here, Father, I wanted to get your opinion on is, are we good? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Last thing here, Father, that I want to get your opinion on is, I get this question sometimes, but how can somebody discern or figure out if they should go to a Novus Ordo Mass or a traditional Latin Mass? I know that you celebrate mm -hmm. both, and right. so I think you have a very balanced opinion on this, but I'd just like your input on that. Yeah. Um... I mean, on a subjective side, there's a lot of things that are going to depend. Mm -hmm. um, what's your your territorial parish's liturgy like? Are you raising children? Mm. Um, for the most part, as a diocesan priest, I want to say, like, don't remove yourself from the diocesan structure. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just that you belong to the diocese, but you you are a gift to the diocese, even if the mm. diocese doesn't appreciate it. Um, I I did this for many years. I, I drove 40 minutes one way to go to the traditional Latin mass, right? Um, and it was good for me I would say if you find yourself in the midst of the average parish mm -hmm. and you just, you're leaving mass mad, <laughs> I would recommend for your sanity that, that you find a traditional Latin mass. If you are basically going to um, the ordinary form of the mass and that's what you know and you've never been to the traditional Latin mass, like I highly recommend that you find mm. the local fraternity parish and go. And go more than once. Go until you can pray, right? Um, because we have a, a at least a millennium of tradition that when you're reading the saints and the mystics and the doctors, this, this is what actually formed them, yeah. right? And how can you understand them or even to my mind, the attempt to understand Sacrosanctum Concilium, which is a Second Vatican Council document on the Reform of Liturgy, or even some of the choices that the Concilium made in mm. the Reform of Liturgy, before you can judge that, if you have no knowledge of what 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 was before, how can you how can you make discernment? Right? Yeah. Um, I know it's contentious today. Um, I, I'm i more of a fan of Benedict XVI's idea of like, uh, like mutual enrichment. Mm. Anyone attached to the TLM won't like what I'm gonna say next. But <laughs> there are some things in the Novus Ordo that, that I, I very much do like yeah um there's some things though in a tlm when i was first learning to to celebrate it i just remember thinking to myself why why in the world would this be changed hmm. and you just I, I didn't get it um i still in large extent don't get it i i love the uh the fact that before I turn from the altar, which symbolizes Christ, to address his people, I kiss Christ. Mm. And then I turn to the people and say, the Lord be with you. There, there's a fundamental beauty in that, right? Uh, when you enter into the Eucharistic prayer, you, know, I, you say that first prayer, Te Igitur, and having called him father I, I i i kiss the altar 
mm. as I'm entering into that prayer. There's just there's moments like that that um, at least part of what the reformers were trying to do in their idea of a simplification. I mean, it says noble simplicity, but I think in some respects, but we so oversimplified that we got a kind of barrenness. Yeah. Um, in the Eastern Church, I think it would have might have gone over a little bit better, but it's because they they have the iconostasis mm. where we don't. Well, the gestures and postures, the movements of servers, all of those things, was actually functioned for us in the West as a as a kind of liturgical iconostasis that let us read the mass. So when that's gone, I mean, all you get is Father's charisma or or lack thereof, <laughs> right? Um, so making that that choice, um, regardless of which choice you make as to where to go, the the job is to find a way to focus on Christ and his work in the liturgy as best you can and to pray away any resentment or bitterness. Mm. Uh, we live in like dodgy liturgical times. It's just the reality. Um, well, if we become so fixated on that, like if you go to a terrible offering of the mass or hear a terrible homily, like surely that's not pleasing to Christ. Uh, nevertheless, he foresaw it when he instituted it down the ages. He saw all the crazy things his priests would do, and he didn't withhold himself back. Hmm. So this would be my my basic answer of how I settled on my vocation to the diocesan priesthood. If Christ is willing to go, so am I. Mm. Now I'm going to do everything I can within my power to be faithfully obedient to Holy Mother Church and the celebration of the liturgy, uh, to keep my priestly promises. I mean, I promise to uh, celebrate the liturgy for the glory of God and the sanctification of, of His yeah. people with reverence uh, <laughs> uh, according to the tradition. Right. Right. Um, and I think that for us priests, you know, for, from a, in accord with the tradition of Roman rite, well, how do you do that if you don't know the tradition of the Roman right. rite? Um, so I'll step across the other line to those who, who think the presence of the traditional Latin masses shouldn't be there. Um, it's a kind of patrimony. Mm -hmm. It's an inheritance, right? And we're poorer for not having it. Right now we're going through a time where there's all this talk about uniformity. Uniformity is not unity. And it's a strange sort of thing when we only want to talk about uniformity when it comes to the, the 1962 missile. Mm. But nevertheless, we permit the Anglican use. We permit the Zaire use. Um, we permit other deviations that are clearly not right. in uniformity with the, the global Latin West. Um, just this one kind of um, divergence that we seem mm -hmm. to say, no, no, uniformity, right? Um, we haven't shut down the... Um, the Mozarabic uh, rite in Santo Domingo de Silos or in the chapel in Toledo. Mm -hmm. We haven't uh, forbidden the Ambrosian rite. I think both of those have been s revamped slightly in accordance with right. the main lines of Sacrosanct Concilium. Um, but let's not forget that there's um, Ethiopian Guise Catholics, mm -hmm. Chaldean Catholics, Maronite Catholics, Syro Malabar Catholics, right? Um, <laughs> every version of Byzantine that you can think of, and Armenians, right? Yeah. Um, and I know I'm missing a bunch, but um, they are in unity. 
um, the diversity of, of acceptable liturgical expression arising out of apostolic Christianity are, are jewels right. um, for Holy Mother Church. And, and we're poor to set one of those jewels aside, right? Yeah. There's a larger, more difficult question about whether these are actually two different rites. Yeah. Yeah, that's a yeah. whole other ballgame. Yeah. But when I was uh, in, I was traveling for Christmas one year, and we went to a mass, and it was not very reverent. Um, pretty sure there were some altar girls. The priest referenced the movie Elf in his homily, and that was one of the main <laughs> main thrusts of the homily. And that mass for me, though, was actually wonderful. I was sitting there, and all these bad things were going on, all these things that obviously are objectionable to me. And I just had a sense that God just wanted me to endure that mass. And so I just offered up <laughs> all of this yeah. shenanigans. That's what it was, just pure it, shenanigans at mass to Jesus. It would be tough to do with that like Sunday after Sunday. Oh, right? it, was, it was once a year. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's something to, um, there's something to that offering. Um, we ought also to be edified mm. by the celebration of mass we we should be fed in a, in a deep spiritual sense and it's really hard to pray and to unite yourself to the holy sacrifice of the mass when there's all this stuff going on yeah you know um so you make the best prudential decision that you can for you and your family um Hopefully avoiding the pitfall of uh, we're the true Catholics over here. Yeah. And there's something wrong with the rest of you. You know, um, if you can avoid that, then then go where um, go where your spiritual life uh, flourishes. Right? Yeah. I found the Tridentine Latin Mass, oddly enough, through the Byzantine Rite. Oh, interesting. And I came back from the Navy. And I couldn't have told you like liturgically or even really religiously what I found lacking in, in the local parishes that I tried, but it was surface sentimentality and, and mm. just it just wasn't working for me. <laughs> uh, the local parishes, uh, the music directors were like lounge singers. Oh. Um, and it was like Father Buddy. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and I happened upon St. Stephen's Ruthenian Byzantine Church. And I went and I was... It was my first time. Like most cradle Catholics, I didn't even know the existence of these <laughs> other churches. And it blew me away. And I knew right away, this is this is how it's supposed to be. Yeah. Like something holy. Um, and, and I mean that separated, mm -hmm. right? Otherworldly just took place in my presence. Uh, and I couldn't get enough of it. Well, oddly, most of the parishioners there were not, in fact, Ruthenian Catholics. Mm -hmm. They were Roman Catholics hiding from bad liturgy. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then we got the new bishop. Uh, this was, what, uh, 2003? Yeah. And um, he permitted the Tridentine Latin Mass. And so I went to the very first one in Phoenix, uh, pretty much since Phoenix became a diocese. And... What I saw there was a different expression, of course. Well, all the things that bowled me over about the Byzantine liturgy, I was like, oh, wait, we have this stuff too? <laughs> Why, how, come we don't, how come we don't use it, right? Um, so the next Sunday after, I went back to the Tridentine Latin Mass, and then it was a low Mass. Mm -hmm. No singing, no incense. And I was like, uh. <laughs> that took me a little bit to get. Once you do kind of get yourself settled in, um, it's a delightful thing, I think, to learn to pray in that silence, mm. which is a much harder thing to achieve in the modern liturgy. Um, it's In the modern liturgy, we're constantly moving 
at a at a pace of something that's always required of us. We've lost the ability to be okay with the, the spirit moving us and keeping us in a place mm. or allowing us to contemplate. We we feel like if I'm not always and constantly engaging in this thing immediately, that somehow I'm not participating properly. Yeah. Um, which is basically how we've been trained to go to Mass in the modern world. Right. Um, the, the gift of the quiet can barely hear the priest, uh, you know, mumbling the Latin and a, and a much softer response from the server um, when I really still didn't understand kind of what was going on. I mean, I knew what was, I knew I was at Mass. <laughs> um, I didn't know the prayers. Hmm. Um, in that, I had to find God in the solitude of those moments. Uh, and it, it, there was a freedom that I experienced in mm. that. Um, I am what might be called like a solemn mass liberal. <laughs> it's, it's really the only one that I, I deeply want with all my hurt. Um, I would do solemn mass all the time, every mm -hmm. time if, if, if I could. I prefer it. Um, but there's a gift in the in the low mass that um, that will actually help you be able to enter in uh, to the average ordinary nonsense that goes on mm. in a parish, right? You you encounter Christ and you touch Him uh, in those liturgical experiences, and you don't just leave them there. Those experiences shape and form you. They, they come with you when you yeah. go elsewhere. Beautiful. Wonderful. Well, that's great. Is there yeah. anything else you'd like to hit on? Otherwise, maybe you could close by giving uh, whoever's watching a blessing. Sure. Uh, we'll just go for the blessing. Let's I'm do it. Talk about. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Um, the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Bow down for the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Amen. May he let his face shine upon you and show you his mercy. Amen. May he turn his countenance toward you and give you his peace. Amen. At benedictio Dei, omnipotentis patris, et filii, et spiritus sancti, descendat superbos, et maniat semper. Amen. Thank you, Father.